You are listening to Armchair Healthcare, a podcast on pills, placebos, and policy. All right, welcome to Armchair Healthcare. What's happening, Max? Well, today, Biogen blew up their uh, premier Alzheimer's asset was was halted, or their, their phase three program was halted because of futility. So basically, they were not going to hit their uh, endpoints pretty much no matter what at this point. So it's yet another failed amyloid anti-amyloid antibody yes another one for the pile where does that bring this to how many how many have failed i don't know but it's it feels like a hundred yeah it feels like a lot and these are some big companies that have made some of these these mistakes and you think they would learn from it they don't because they want to be the ones to accomplish it because if it works it will be huge yeah well i mean we've been pretty consistent with our uh criticism or our skepticism i should say about uh these this particular uh, class of drug, yes, as well as the entire amyloid hypothesis. Yeah, let's say let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that the amyloid hypothesis is true, and and they are what are, are causing Alzheimer's. Clearly, there's no way to actually target it and get a drug that is both safe and effective. We've had a lot of amyloid targeting drugs that have been safe but they basically don't work at all. That's like the Lilly drug. And then you have like, you know, Biogen and kind of earlier trials for, for this drug. Um, they, they did have some interesting efficacy at the higher doses, but they also had a lot of edema on the brain. So basically brain swelling. So you don't want that. So they were trying to really thread that needle of having something that was safe and effective at the same time. And I don't know if, I don't think that's possible. I don't and, think that's and, a good idea. It doesn't seem like... If you guys you have Alzheimer's, great. Let's protect your brain. But I don't think causing like trying to give you a drug where if you misdose it slightly, causes edema, cerebral yeah. edema is yeah. a great idea. Yeah, especially for something like Alzheimer's, which you can. Th- I I mean, it's a horrible disease, but I mean, you, you can live with it. So, um, you know, dying quickly versus dying slowly. I don't know. I don't know how the FDA would feel about that. Um, but anyway, I mean, it, it failed. It didn't even come close. And we had a hint of this back in 2018 when they increased the size of, uh, of this trial by like 500 patients. They probably, they had an interim analysis that said, uh, yes, it's on the cusp. We can't tell. It doesn't look great. And so they're like, all right, let's get an answer. Yeah. They, they blamed it on, um, some, some patient variability. Yeah, like it worked for a few people, but then it didn't work for a lot of people. So we're going to add more people. But also the, the placebo might have also worked for some people. Yes. so That's they, another form exactly. of variability. Yes. Or n- not worked. It's just they didn't. So, I mean, for all, any of these drugs, it's just slowing the rate of deterioration. So it's not about like placebo magically working. It's just, hey, these guys didn't deteriorate as th- fast as we thought. So, you know, um, the other drug didn't look like it separated. Yeah, so, so they, they, they tried. And, of course, at the time they said, no, this is not a sign of anything. This was just, you know, due to some statistics. That's the only reason we're increasing the size of the trial. Wait, well, wait, wait. So the only reason they ever increase the size of a trial is because they need better statistics, which means one of their parameters was no good when they designed it. Yes. But, but they were kind of either underpowered, it. or they had their p value is too high, or the uh, variability is too high, or yeah, one the standard like deviation, yeah. Um, well, though, so the CMO, what, what what he had said was that, you know, they had done the same analysis with Tecfidera, which is a, one of their MS drugs that got approved, and you know that was fine, and you know it had a positive phase three, so they just did the same thing here. Nothing to worry about. Nothing nothing to see here. Please ignore the fact that I sold a lot of my shares, like, right after the Phase 1B data. Mm-hmm. This is like bioturn talk. I know. It is, really. I mean, th- I mean, think about it. How do you, how do you ha- be, like, a successful pharma exec? You're talking to other people and talking about how much money to invest in a drug and then say, hey, let's go for our amyloid drug. Like, let's, let's invest $800 million, which is what Biogen spent on this. Let's spend $800 million on an amyloid drug. And then let's spend some more money on another one, you know, the Band 2401, which which they also have, which which is complete garbage. 
I mean, they did some subgroup analysis to say that it worked when that had like some major imbalances in it. I mean, they, they literally are acting like bio turds. I don't know, man. They said Biogen hasn't come up with any good ideas in the longest time. Um, Avenex, 1990s. Well, they've bought some things, you know what I mean? That, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, like the uh, the SMA drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, like they've made some good like little decisions, but nothing that's been transformational for the company. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, Tecvidera was a good idea, but that was, I mean, they just reformulated something that's been available in Germany for years. So it wasn't... I mean, it was a good idea, and it was a simple idea, and it, and it worked pretty much. But and they kind of stole it. Uh, uh, well, I, I don't think for, Forward Pharma has been doing well in that lawsuit. I know, but that doesn't mean they didn't steal it. They uh, stole the idea. Somebody, Like you said, somebody else was already selling it. They saw, oh, this actually kind of works. We don't know why, but like, let's do it. Well, reformulating something that's already available is not stealing an idea. It's, it's yeah, improving yeah, upon yeah. something that you know is out they there. Reformulate. Yeah, they, they got something, and they uh, it's like getting a patent on um amphetamine salts instead of just amphetamine like oh the salts are really important yeah, so they're, they're mean, really they're it really it doesn't work without the salts no, yeah I, I, don't, I don't think so well no there, there was definitely no innovation there so okay l- let's just say this biogen has not been innovative probably for like 20 years this is what i i feel like all the and maybe i'm overlooking something right now but all like the the big you know the, the original biotechs from like 1995 they had one great or maybe two great uh low-hanging fruit ideas where they're like oh shit we can just make proteins and put them into people let's just put a really important protein like i don't know rethropoietin yeah into somebody and we can just make that in the lab and give it to people and they're like oh this is great and they, they chose these really simple things they did it and they have not come out with anything since then because the, the the core of these companies wasn't based around like designing new things. It was based around the simple premise that we can make biology stuff now. But in their defense, even the pharmas are kind of like that. I mean, look at Abvi. What is it like? Two thirds of their sales are coming from Humira. So one drug, and that was really just a copy of someone else's drug. Not a oh, yeah, copy, but yeah. like a, a, you know, similar version. Well, they do this same idea. I mean, they were spun off from from Abbott, who sold all sorts of other stuff like formula, right? Well, yeah, no, but so and I mean, there they, was it wasn't exactly an innovative company. No, no, and I mean, and they had bought this from Knoll Pharmaceuticals, and this was a a, a drug based on a Cambridge antibody technology. Uh, so this is a giant company that has one drug, and then if you remember Pfizer, which is different now, but like it used to be basically like a huge heaping part of their Inc- net income com- came from Lipitor. Again, one drug. It, it's like other other than well, maybe Pfizer is really good at taking other people's good idea and making the second best drug in the class. Yeah, that's all they've done. They decided, all right, we're spending too much money in R and D. Let's streamline this for us because we know we can just we don't have to be first to do anything. But we're Pfizer, so we can pump the market full of uh, whatever you know second best drug there is out there. And they wait till somebody comes out with like the first PD one or the second PD one, and they're like, okay, we'll have a PD one too, or the first. I don't know. Well, they were the fourth statin, I think, with Lipitor. But Lipitor was for a period the best statin until uh, Crestor came around. Yeah, and so they they don't really care about being first. They'll just like like okay, you find the leads, and then we'll make another drug that hits the same thing. Yeah, and then use brute force to get it on TV all the time. Yes. I mean, really, the the only company I can think of that has been serially innovative was Genentech, which which got swallowed by Roche. Yeah, yeah. But it, same idea with them a little bit. We're just going to shit on everyone. Let's just shit on, shit on Genentech? every company. I'm going to bring the up— The sainted G- Genentech? Yeah, and I love Art Genentech. Levinson? Yeah, I love Genentech, too. But um, uh, what they did was they were like— They invented monoclonal antibodies. Well, they didn't invent them, but they were the first ones to— They were pioneers. Be, pioneers, exactly. Great. Uh, and so the same thing. They're like, oh, like we have this new technology. We just have to bind stuff. Right, where the the low hanging fruit for this? Yeah, but they, uh, I mean, it it wasn't so easy because they had to come up with. I mean, at the time, no one did like HER two testing on patients to see if you know they have this if they're HER two receptor positive or or receptor positive for anything. Like there wasn't this genetic testing that people did 
to um, you know really focus their clinical trials on a certain subpopulation, they were like the trailblazers. Because if they if they didn't use these you know HER2 tests, I mean they would have had to have like a ten thousand patient trial to show that Herceptin worked. Instead, they could do it in I think I think at the time it might have been just hundreds of patients in their like first trials, and they showed that it worked, and it was off to the races, and and that became like the whole. The the core of cancer treatment is yeah. like see like yeah. are you her her two positive, all the something node negative, you know all these different subtypes and you can have really targeted drugs and 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 uh, get them to the market with kind of minimal trial sizes. I mean that was them. Yeah, I know, I know. It's hard to shit on Genentech. They kind of changed all of pharma. Yeah, and in a dramatic way. Yeah. So although the, you know. Um, if you remember, like before Art Levinson took over, and I believe it was uh, Kirk Robb was the uh, CEO. I mean, it was also kind of a bio turd. It was it was not a high quality company. It was really when they got Art Levinson, who's one of their you know uh, researchers, to take over. I mean, he just he made sure that what they did they did in a thoughtful way and they did it right. And it was like a major change in like that that made Genentech what it was. Well, back to Biogen. Do you have anything else to say about uh, the bio turd, the giant bio turd of the minute? Uh, I mean, in terms of Biogen, now they're talking about like, okay, they need to either buy somebody or they need to sell themselves. So we might get another Bristol Myers sell gene snooze fest of M and A. Great. You know, it's like, oh, okay, fine. I mean, what do you get with Biogen? They, they can't make a drug. You're not buying any sort of internal capacity. Right, you, If you bought Biogen, you're basically just buying a holding company for their current assets. You're just going to have the tails on those, and that's it. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, like uh, uh, Andy Biotech um, posted one of their 2015 uh, R&D Day slides, and it showed that almost every late-stage pipeline product that Biogen had and, and featured in 2015 has failed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this vaunted R&D engine, it, it's not really there. They're, they're basically doing these Hail Mary passes. Um, and it, it's worked in some cases, but obviously did not in this case. I mean, they blew $800 million. Think about how many, you know, other programs that could have funded with that money. Well, look at their stock price. Also thinking about money. It's down seventeen billion, at least the last time I looked at it today. Yes. Seventeen billion dollars. And to me, what's more surprising here, this program was worth seventeen billion dollars to the market. Oh yeah. Oh my god. I mean, it's just it just puts into stark reality uh, the difference between, you know, how I see the world and other people. Yes. Well, and funny thing is the market's been remarkably consistent on how it values late stage amyloid antibodies because i i seem to remember elon getting the same amount of uh market cap boost when they had bappy bapanuzumab back in the day it's it, it's just funny it's like it's like 15 billion dollars that's like a good number for alzheimer's because if it works it'll be huge yeah man it's not gonna work let's move on guys but to what i feel like some people just want to just feel like they're doing something yeah, but I mean, this it's, it's not going to work. I, how about, okay, there's, there's other things that we can target here. Um, we've talked about them a little bit before. There's tau. There's sort of the neuroinflammatory aspect of the disease. There's some microglia stuff going on. How about we look at some of those? Yeah, I mean, I've always liked, there's this particular protein. I mean, I'm going to go really go off the rails here into uh, some basic science. There's this particular protein that's involved in uh, the stress response of the cell called presenilin. It both exists and it sort of controls some uh, calcium flux inside the cell, and which is important for sending signals and you know activating action potentials, that sort of thing. And also, it happens to be, it gets expressed on the outside of the cell, and it's the gamma secretase. It was identified as the gamma secretase, which is what cleaves uh, amyloid precursor protein into amyloid plaques. So this thing is sort of tied into a lot of other stuff. We could maybe target it, but I, I, to my knowledge, no one's ever gone after this. Presenilin, look it up. And moreover, some of the familial forms of the disease are mutations in that protein. It just, it's just an idea, guys. I mean, maybe there's an issue with this drug that causes the plaques to form, which also regulates the degree of excitability of your neurons. 
I'm just guessing. I, I've not seen anything. There's maybe some basic research out there, so I'm going to uh, caveat this in a big, big way. Maybe someone else has tried to come up with a uh, small monk or something else to affect this. But, yeah, just there's other stuff out there we could be looking at. It's just the fact is everyone's been obsessed with these plaques. Yes. Because, of course, your brain filling up with goo, right? That's got to be it, right? Brain full of slime? That sounds like it should be it. It sounds like it. But it sounds like more of the effect than the cause, in my opinion. Like, as the disease progresses, that just gets worse. So you're not really targeting... Well, yeah, you can cause the disease. Yeah, you can put in amyloid fibrils into somebody's brain, well, a mouse's brain, and they don't, they don't, they don't get sick. They don't. There's nothing there. I mean, the only way to like really cause directly from these amyloids. I mean, this is that's why you hear some people talk about like the monomers or the ligamers, yada yada, all these different sort of stages of the polymerization of the protein and this and that. If you, I believe it's the sol, soluble oligomers, if you inject them into a, a rat brain, they can cause some neurodegeneration, mm-hmm. but, but that's it. You know, n- none of the other forms of it cause anything. And there's some questions about that because they're just the right size to sort of clog up a whole bunch of other crap. So maybe, but there's not really a strong correlation between the amount of actual amyloid in people's brains and their symptoms. I mean, I believe statistically speaking, one of us here in this room has got amyloids in our brain or will one day. Well, probably me. I'm the oldest one. Um, No, I mean, look, we we can definitely be going in other directions. And I mean, think about all the billions of dollars between this and solonuzumab from Eli Lilly and bapanuzumab from who was it, Wyeth and Elan. And I mean, just so much money that could have probably gone to, to better uses. I think a lot of what happens is, especially in big pharma, we mentioned this a little bit with Pfizer, is there's a bit of a scientific echo chamber, right? Where uh, since the cost of going down one of these roads is so high, uh, they kind of just look at what they're, the other guys in the space are doing. And I think that adds a lot of weight to what they end up choosing to do because they're like, well, these other guys have looked at it. It can't be that bad of an idea. Yeah, it's instant validation for your idea yeah. if you're you're one of these like scientists. Yeah, like like Lily had an anti-amyloid, so it mean it didn't work, but ours is really good. Yeah, and and we've seen also seen this on the on the BD side as well. Like I mean, I remember it, it it's always goes in cycles. Like one of them buys a company that's working in an area and then suddenly they're all buying companies that working in an area. I mean, remember when uh heat shock proteins were hot. And I mean, whatever happened to that? That was like 12 years ago nothing like there there's just n- they've never gone anywhere um and and we've seen that in, in in other areas i mean we're seeing that probably right now with you know some of those immuno oncology assets that aren't going to go anywhere like the was it ox 40 yeah like a lot of these things were really expensive and just you know they might have spent a billion dollars on a phase one company and it's like poof but they, but they all have to have it a lot of it's just competition between these people they're not actually using their brains they're like, well, but what if it works? And then we won't have one. A lot of times making these decisions via committee and let's face facts, these giant companies are just have our committee stacked upon committee, stacked upon committee. Like no one, like the, the great ideas, really innovative ideas don't shoot to the top in those situations. Like the really safe, I'm not going to get fired type ideas rise to the top. Yes. And, but just, just to kind of add to the, committees there's there's actually probably like five more layers at a a typical uh uh, pharma i remember um a while back i was i was uh at a pfizer analyst day and i was sitting next to the general counsel and kind of the theme of the analyst day was we're cutting bureaucracy we're cutting all these layers from r d we're going to be more efficient so i asked him so how many layers did you have before like from like a scientist to the like the ceo in 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 r d and and you know, how many do you have now? He's like, oh, we've gone from 12 to 8. That's a 50 or 33% reduction. Yeah. In relative terms, it's a lot, but you still have a lot of bureaucracy. I love how the answer is always like, oh, you know what we should do in this situation? Cut R&D. We're not coming up with any great ideas, so you know what we should do? Cut R&D. Well, We're we- spending all this money on R&D, and for some reason, the great ideas aren't making it through committee. Well, they're, they're sales and marketing organizations. That, I mean, they literally are like, well, we'll just buy the biotechs. 
And so that's why they're they're overpaying for a lot of these biotechs because they're like, well, we don't have anything in our pipeline. We and we need to get this. We need to win this this fight. We can't lose this deal. And they just think about winning the deal and not what makes sense for the company or for shareholders. I mean, that's how you know Roche, you know, spent so much on on Spark. I mean, it was a it was a bidding war. You know, it, it becomes about winning for either the CEO or the BD person, and not about what's good. Exactly. So this is this is I think something that takes a while to learn in this space or in any sort of business when you're looking at investing and everything else is that you have stupid human beings involved. It does it looks like this like a company is something that is greater than the sum of its parts, but really it's not. You have people just trying to uh get their paycheck and go to the beach on the weekend, and that's basically it. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, we'll we'll see what happens with Biogen. Um, people are saying, oh, you know, they should buy someone or get bought. Um, and, and one of the candidates that, that people I think are thrown out there is Sage. Um, it, you know, if they buy that and Sage is drugs. It's work, neuro. It's neuro. It's, yeah. it's sort of kind of in their wheelhouse. Yeah, I mean, it would be an expensive buy. I mean, Sage right now is like $8 billion. Oh, yeah. But they they recently just got their, their uh, postpartum depression drug approved. Yeah. Um, and, you know, of course, this is not like this is not one for a mass market. This is a 60 hour intravenous infusion and it requires you to be an inpatient. So it's it's this is this is going to be for basically like the suicidal people at like Bellevue. And um, I mean, it's thirty four thousand dollars for a course of treatment. And again, it's impatient. So, I, like, this is not something that people, normal people, are going to want to have. And then, and then, I mean, obviously, you know, generally, postpartum depression is not one that has high demand. Not because like there aren't a lot of people who have it. It's just a lot of the women are scared to take anything because they're afraid of what that what effect that might have on their baby. Like Zoloft is typically used, but like a lot of these women, even the suicidal ones, are like, no, I can't take Zoloft. It would be dangerous. I mean, if they're breastfeeding or something? Yeah. I mean, because a lot of this stuff is probably pretty soon after the, you know, the baby's born. So they're still kind of in that, in that period. Um, so you know, we'll see. There's a really wide range of uh, consensus estimates for, uh, for this drug for Sage. Um, I think some of them are in like the four or $500 million range. I think consensus is around 300. I think the low ones are at a hundred. I'd probably go for that lower part because I know I was looking at it and I mean, besides like only being used in the severe patients who are like really on the verge of suicide and essentially committed, I would think that just demographically, it's probably only going to be upper middle class and upper class people because, you know, th this is not a, a drug that you go to your pharmacy for and you pay your five or $20 or $50 copay for. This is a hospital drug. So a lot of people have co-insurance with their health insurance. And so if, if they're paying, so not only will they pay probably for this drug and there'll be a hospital markup, they'll also have to pay for the hospital stay. They'll have to pay like 10 or 20% or 30% of that cost. I mean, that's a lot of money. And normal people won't be able to afford that. It's going to be just like the top 5 or 10% of the people. Not to mention uh, that... Uh, people only people of means are going to be as highly engaged in the medical system for them to be identified as postpartum and then to go through the steps of actually getting treatment like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's just going to be it's going to be a very small market. Also, the data is not that wonderful. Um, if you look at uh, their their label, they have their their uh, phase three data there, um, and so on the the ham d score uh people on drug had um 17 uh, uh, uh decrease of 17 points on that ham d scale uh people who received placebo had a 13 point decrease so in the end I, it looks like just you know giving someone placebo gets you about like 80 percent of the way there mm -hmm. this drug helps a little bit more mm -hmm. um i mean you know the problem is here is you know, for anyone developing a drug for postpartum, is there is a natural uh, propensity for the issues to resolve. This isn't like depression, like regular depression, which literally could go on for thirty years and never resolve. 
Postpartum does typically resolve after a period of time. I mean, sometimes it's longer. I'm not saying it's not severe and not, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah, and it can you know, develop the, into a more a consistent long-term depression too. But it it's, can, yeah. That's not normally what's covered under that sort of uh, nomenclature. You know, you, you sort of have a certain momentum in it. So it, it, it's hard. Like if you don't get treated, you'll, you'll get, you're, you're likely to get better by yourself. You know, it might not be tomorrow, but it, it will be at some point. Well, you know, regular depression, I mean, it can, it can just be, you know, a forever war inside your head. Yeah. I see a lot of that happening too. Of uh, people going, even if there's their depression is severe enough to go to a doctor and be like, I need help. Them getting put into the system and going through a series of steps that are going to progressively exclude people from actually getting the SAGE drug. Like, okay, are you sure it's not just the baby blues? Why don't you wait another week? Because uh, there's also very mild forms of uh, postpartum depression that are really, really common, but they pass very quickly. It's just because of the sort of hormonal fluctuations immediately after birth. You can feel like weepy, that sort of stuff. And it just kind of goes away. And it's just very, uh, very short. So I imagine the doctor say, oh, well, just wait a week. See if you still feel this way. Come back. And they come back and like, oh, okay, well, let's, you know, let's try this. Let's try this pill or this pill. And like, you go away. And then you come back. And you say, no, it's still really bad. Mm, maybe let's try an SSRI for a month go away, come back. And they're like, okay, maybe we can try the SAGE drug. I mean, that's, there's a number of layers that you would have to get through, right? And not to mention, uh, due to the natural course, you might be getting better through just uh, time at any of these points. And so I don't, it's, I'm pretty skeptical about some of the estimates for this drug as well. Yeah, exactly. So, and I mean, SAGE has other drugs, um, you know, they have uh, oral versions of this drug. So they're developing that for postpartum and also just major depressive disorder. But we'll see. I mean, the data so far has been positive, but the trials have been unusually short for depression trials. So um, it's generally been in like the two or four week kind of range. Yeah, I've also, there's another thing that I've been worried about. I, I, I don't think I brought it up in the podcast before. Which is that the steroid, which they're putting back into you, right? That's what's you. That's a natural uh, neurosteroid that's in your body when you're pregnant, and the withdrawal from which causes a lot of these symptoms when you have postpartum depression because you're basically you're doped up and feel groovy all the time because you've got this stuff coming through you, right? And so you're, you go through these withdrawal symptoms that can cause you to become depressed. These patients don't respond to benzos because. The exposure to this is like it's also habituating you in the same way. So what you're doing with SAGE is you're literally giving back the quote-unquote drug that you're withdrawing from to prevent the effects that you're withdrawing from. So it kind of begs the question, are we just kicking this can down the road by a few months? If you, if you get a massive like 60-hour infusion dose of this stuff, you might feel great there for – a while until it runs out and then what no and, I, I think they had they had follow-up so i i don't think uh like the ham d scores didn't like yeah, rebound. i mean or maybe it's just kicking it down the road and i don't know it's just i've always been worried about this like you're literally using the same drugs like you know what the best thing for opioid withdrawal is opioids opioids yeah they so, do kind of work don't yeah. they um yeah i mean we'll we'll, we'll see on uh you know, on, on Sage and like there are other drugs. I mean, you know, as as, as kind of you were make, making the point of just now, I mean, their data so far in their other drugs have been relatively short. And like for depression trials, I mean, you really want to see if does the brain just get used to the drug? So, you know, you're getting like maybe a six, six month holiday and then it's just you're going to be back to normal. I mean, that's why you have these long term trials. And also, what are the long term side effects? I mean, are people going to be sleepy for six months or a year? Because, you know, that's one of the major side effects of this. It makes you sleepy, just like, you know, a lot of the benzodiazepines. It's a, it's a GABA, like all the rest of them. Yeah. So it, it it's hits hitting you. the same. I mean, you know, people will say, oh, it hits a different receptor, a different subclass receptors. Yeah, yeah. The delta receptor is the one they will talk about. But it's hitting GABAs. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that basically means that, uh, it, I mean, it's hitting the same, you know, GABA, which is Ambien. It, it, it's kind of in the same general family. I don't know. Is that the broader right way to put class. it? Broader a, class. It's in a broader class. Yeah. Yes. Ambien's a Z drug. This one's no. in a new cl subclass of the like the various GABA receptor agonists. Yeah, exactly. So 
we we will see but i mean look biogen could really do this and it would be transformational for the company because i mean imagine you'll have another you know like a a big um you know drug to treat depression um you know a completely different class than all the other drugs that are being used right now the ssris and and whatever's um and and not as uh you know when, when they when sage will have their oral that will be very different than you know, asketamine, which was recently approved by J&J, which is an intranasal, which requires you to be in the clinic. So, I mean, that, that could be a, something interesting. Oh, w- one other thing, since I mentioned asketamine, well, what what happens to ketamine in if, if like, uh, you've just given birth? Does it, does it get transferred to the kids? So, I mean, could some of these postpartum are you, are women you, get asketamine? Uh, you're asking me if, it, like, ketamine goes through breast milk? Yeah. I mean, is it safe? like could people uh, just use it off label and instead of t- spending sixty hours in a clinic, just spend like two hours in another clinic? Um, that that's uh like a complicated PK issue. I don't honestly know the answer. Okay, a lot of stuff does though. Like, I yeah. a majority of stuff goes through milk, yeah. and some of the things you just say, ah, eh, it's not going to actually cause anything. Well, even if it does go through the milk, it's not going to cause any sort of bad effects on the kid, and then it's okay to take while breastfeeding, but. Most things do, because drugs tend to be fatty, and there's a lot of fat in milk. So, hmm. well, still, I mean, you know, I'm I'm not sure how like what sort of break some of these women will have to take. You know, I mean, sixty hours of getting this neurosteroid, I'm sure they they won't be able to breastfeed for a little while. I mean, the kid could could fall asleep. I mean, one of the um, side effects of this drug is you know, fainting during the infusion. Yeah, I would be surprised if they were able to uh, consistently breastfeed while doing that. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so one one more thing about Biogen, um, you know, uh, just this is kind of like a little funny cell side issue. Like I remember uh, a little while back, a company had some bad news, and there was like a cell side report that called it. Oh, it's a clearing event. So now, you know, the bad news is out of the way. It's time for you to buy the stock. So RBC came out with a report referring to this as a transformational failure. I love that. It's like, it's really positive. It, this failure is transformational. You know, failure is good, uh, unless you had the stock yesterday. Then, you're, you know, it's not so good. Uh, well, it's, yeah, exactly. This is definitely a bad thing, but there is something to be said. Uh, if if uh, there's dead cats do bounce, Max. Yeah, if you fall, what is it? If you throw them off a high enough ledge? Yeah, that's the same. Seventeen billion stories high. <laughs> I bet. I bet it would bounce. I'm not calling. I'm not calling whether this is going to bounce or not. But it is a thing that people trade on. If nothing else, does it make Biogen a great investment right now? I would have to look more closely uh, at this. Yes, price. We, we're not giving any investment. We're advice. not giving investment advice. Yes. Um, but if you look at the history of biotech, I mean, at some point, Biogen will probably have another little bobble that investors will get all excited about. Or they'll get bought. So, I mean, if you look at it that way, you know, whatever, it might bounce. But no, we are not giving investment advice, and I am not running out and buying Biogen. So in other news, there was a there was a study that was published in Circulation on sugary drinks. And people who have more than two sugary drinks per day were shown to have a higher risk of uh, cardiovascular mortality so what constitutes a sugary drink i'm assuming like a like a coca-cola or something a coca-cola or does orange juice count probably um i i didn't look at that part of the methodology what about coconut water ah, i don't know it's probably sugary it's kind of sugary. yeah i mean it's, it's all sugar, sugar right in it. yeah. yeah so anyway well th- i mean th- this cohort study was going on for quite a long time so most of the some of those things were not available like coconut water no one heard of it 10 years ago so i don't think it's actually in the study but um and, and just looking at some of the demographics of the people who had two or more drinks a day i don't think they were drinking the coconut water so you know, one of my issues with the study is even though i'm sure the conclusion is probably right that it's bad for you to have sugary drinks but if you look at kind of like these people had a lot of other problems you know, they tended to smoke more than the other the other groups. They tended to be fatter. They 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 tended to um, not use multi, not not take multivitamins. They tended to you know eat more calories. They ate a higher glycemic load. They didn't eat as much you know whole grains and 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 whatever. 
um, the, you know, they and they ate more like processed meat. Maybe the conclusion should be drinking sugary drinks causes you to smoke and eat salami. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I mean, basically, the only thing you can really conclude is if you have an unhealthy eating lifestyle, it's going to affect your mentality in the long run. Although we can't really tell which one is, is, is driving this. Um, which is the problem with these cohort studies because there's always like these other factors and sometimes they try to adjust for it, but do they fully adjust for it? You don't know. It's it's just like using some equations. You don't know what it would look like in real life. Um, hey, those are, that's statistics. Statistics is equations, Max. No, I know, but like you're adjusting for things and like, so you're, you're providing an estimate, but it's not, it's not necessarily the truth. You know, especially with these like multifactorial there are some cohort studies. There are some un- imbalances in the baseline. And this is this is like I think this is worth being said about like literally every study. Like because you they, they always say, "Oh, we're going to adjust for socioeconomic status and political affiliation." And you can't do that. The small amount of people that drink sugary drinks and don't have other sort of lifestyle issues are going to get increased weight right and they might not balance out in any other sort of way people that are like the exceptions become, right they weigh more they They're, weigh more oh, okay yeah no i i can see that and honestly like some of these like adjustments i view as like fudge factors i mean this is basically what the bio turds do with some of their their analyses of their trials like they you know they're kind of manipulating the data a lot of times they just want it to look the way they want it to look um so you don't know I mean, like, there was that egg study that was kind of controversial recently that came out. Um, I don't have the data in front of me, but I remember it was like, if you looked at it just like, uh, you know, the people who had two or more eggs a day or something like that, or one or more or one or more eggs a day, tended to have a greater mortality. But then there was like another statistic that showed like, if you're adding half an egg, it actually doesn't increase your mortality. So it was just kind of weird data. And also, if you adjusted for red meat, there was, like, other things. But, of course, all the journalists were saying, eggs are bad. I know. I saw all these cohort eggs studies were just... Eggs are good. Yeah, eggs are good. And just these cohort studies were just so messy. I don't know how you can conclude anything from them. I mean, this is almost like humanities-level stuff we're seeing in these cohort studies. Yeah, I always believe, and maybe this is because I worked in like basic science and not statistics or sociology or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, I believe it's always uh, useful to have an appeal to reason. And we already know that dietary uh, cholesterol is just a small fraction of the cholesterol in your body. And so it probably has a relatively small impact on your chances of heart disease. Yeah. And cholesterol is only one of the factors involved in heart disease as well. So it becomes increasingly small. So I'm of the mind that eggs, eating an egg every few days is probably not going to kill you. I don't think, you know, as I mean, if you're eating, it depends how you're eating the egg. If you're having it on like, um, like an English muffin and then you're also having a bunch of potatoes in the same meal. Yeah, that's probably going to be bad for you. And this is probably- I always thought you were going to say like if you're having like an egg on top of a hamburger. Yeah, what's wrong with an English muffin? What's wrong with an English muffin, well, no, Max? Just because it's a lot of carbs, man. It might be a lot of carbs, but... No, it's a lot of carbs, and then you have the potatoes, which is a starchy vegetable, so I would call that a relatively unhealthy meal. Well, I mean, so if, it's if, kind if, of a lot for breakfast. If you're having it with, like, you know, like what I do, I'll have, like, cottage cheese or something. Cottage cheese is very high in cholesterol. I don't care. I don't care. My, my cholesterol is fine. I have it regularly tested. Um... I honestly know. I, 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 I have a nice high-fat diet, and I love it. Everything tastes great. So anyway, and it, because again, what you said, you know, the dietary fat's not really what's causing the cholesterol in your body. It's like the other stuff. So, um, but I mean, just because of the, the age of, the, you know, the, this, um, like at least this study with the sugary drinks, for example, it started in the 90s. So, I mean, what do you think people who ate a lot of eggs ate then? They were not on a keto diet. There was no such thing as a keto diet. These were people who were probably having it with like hash browns something else like you know like a like a denny's breakfast exactly yeah and and yeah those people are probably not healthy and yeah it's probably going to be bad for you but like if you're using it you know if you have like a little avocado on the side or something like it's probably really good and then you know that's that's a completely different profile i mean same is you could say this about olive oil olive oil is it's like it's an oil it's it's tasty is it better than sunflower oil i don't honestly know but the people that 
Well, yeah, that's the thing. Like, I'm just I'm asking the question. I don't have an answer here. But is olive oil really that much better than any other sort of vegetable oil, or is it just that people that use more olive oil in their cooking probably right, okay. eat more healthy stuff? Well, I don't know. You're um, not. You don't deep fry stuff in olive oil. You sprinkle it on salad. No, you can deep fry stuff in olive oil. You can't. Nobody does. Well, I don't know. Like, literally nobody does that. Well, you're not deep frying it, but you can... Well, I don't know, whatever. You can, exactly. You can saute it. But you know what you deep fry fried chicken in? What? Pink Another lard? oil. Yeah. Oh. And peanut oil is the best. Yeah, that's one of the best ones. I, I used to do it in Crisco. Wow. Shortening. Or just lard. Lard is, actually makes a really good chicken. Uh, yeah, lard. What was that? That was the... Um, there was that... Uh, like, the heart attack diner or something, like in Arizona... They they had like a the quadruple bypass burger and yeah everything was cooked in lard. Apparently lard, it tasted really good. Yeah, lard tastes really good. Uh, my grandma makes cakes sometimes. She won't tell anyone that she used lard in them, but she does. I know. Well, yeah, no. If you go to southern restaurants, yeah, you'll see like that tub of lard. I know. I can hear my southern accent coming out in this. I feel like I'm getting <laughs> possessed by my ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some lard. Yeah. Some the nice south lard. was founded on lard, lard and slavery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so um look i like i like putting butter on stuff or ghee you know ghee ghee i like the also the sound of a ghee. ghee what is ghee ghee is just um it's like a type of butter what is it like a uh, it's clarified butter yeah clarified butter so it doesn't have some of the milk solids yeah that's it yeah it's just a solid that like basically it doesn't go bad i mean you can have it just like going on for months it just you doesn't just leave butter out pretty much I don't know, you don't you? really have to refrigerate butter. Oh, well, I always refrigerate. You just cover it up. I mean, it will go rancid eventually, yeah. but all oils might go rancid. Oh. I like, you know, I like coconut oil. I know that's a very um, controversial oil because, like, oh my god, all the saturated fat, but it's so good. I don't know. I really enjoy it. Don't and... you hear? Coconut oil has been redeemed, like avocados. Has it? I mean, it's it like there have been so many twists and turns here. It's like an episode of The Bachelor or something. You know, is is coconut oil in favor or out of favor? I think palm oil is still bad, but the other the other like saturated vegetable fats are all o- a okay now. Okay, well I, I think like it. Palm oil is mostly bad because it is like bad for the environment. Oh well, then it's I'm good. not an expert. I'm kidding. Did uh, you just say that you, that's 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 good because you want? Well, the yeah, it's not bad for die? you to eat it i think it is too i think that's true oh it might be i've never had like palm oil so i don't know if like it's like some super fantastic thing it's just from like little bitty coconuts okay i you know i mean I, it's just like those nuts that are like up on a, a palm tree that aren't coconuts those other ones oh okay i thought it was like from i've never had it so i didn't even know where it was from i thought it was like if you get you can like open up a palm leaf or something and like it'll come out or no something. some of these nuts and that you from squeeze. these nuts yeah some of these nuts that you squeeze and uh, and i love that out. you have the hand motion there too <laughs> um anyway is there any more biotech news uh well we can talk about uh, space herpes Space herpes. So, um, yes, let's talk about space herpes. Yeah, so NASA uh, came out with a warning about... I don't know why they came out with a warning. Well, there was a paper, uh, like, apparently. Be careful, people. You, your herpes might relapse if you go into space. Yeah, yeah. basically, the, 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 what they were saying is um, there was some evidence that people's herpes would relapse when because of the, the kind of the space voyage. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. I mean, first of all, well, going this... up into space with so many Gs is like taxing on the body and then not having your muscles move for long periods of time because there's zero gravity put is taxing on the body and then you have like all these other things going on so apparently it it weakens your immune system which allows the herpes to come back so basically uh, the space station is one giant venereal cesspool well yeah this this means that at least two because one you could just chalk up as like ah that's bad luck it means maybe at least two astronauts have herpes I'm I'm sure it's more than that. I I'm mean, sure it's more than that too. From what I hear, they just screw like crazy. Well, yeah, they're astronauts. Can you I imagine, know. Like, it's like, hey, sexy. I'm an astronaut. No, you're lying to me. No, here, here's a picture of me on the space shuttle. Yeah, you know? they're just the <laughs> very most attractive job as far as uh, fireman, policeman, like a job that you would choose uh, as a six year old. By the way, you're not allowed to say fireman anymore. There was a whole um, controversy I'm, I'm, recently okay. because of Peppa Pig. They mentioned they used the word fireman instead of firefighter and so people went completely crazy over this peppa pig episode 
Oh, I'm just, I'm actually commenting on these historically masculine jobs. I'm actually commenting on the fact that they've historically been held by men, astronauts, police officers, and firefighters. And are you that saying that female increased... astronauts are not attractive? No, I'm not, I'm not saying anything on the subject at all right this second. But I'm saying some of these traditionally masculine jobs have a sort of uh, je ne sais quoi in the, uh, the social context of them that makes it sexier if you have them. Like, ooh, that person must be extra masculine because they're in this very masculine job where they fly into space. Although, I mean, they do all require PhDs. So, I don't know. It's like a whole combo. Like, it means you're... You're very athletic and also incredibly intelligent. I see. I'm already turned on. <laughs> okay, great. And so yeah, I want everyone to go back. There's actually, when you first said space herpes, I thought about alien space herpes. Alien space herpes, which is featured prominently in the, I think it was late 80s, really, really horrible B-movie, Ice Pirates. Oh, was that? I loved that movie, but I don't remember anything about it. Was that about space herpes? Oh, well, it had space herpes in it. It's about the uh, piracy of ice. And I think it was like a post. Post apocalyptic. Well, well, it was in a a post Star Wars era where everyone's like, ooh, sci fi is big. Let's make a sci fi comedy. I think it was early 80s. Uh, The the special effects are really horrible. The special effects are really awful, but they run into space herpes. And their their uh, spaceship gets infected with space herpes. It's awesome. I I remember really enjoying that movie when it was on like HBO or whatever back, way back when, but I, I don't remember anything about it. Um, you know, I just thought about like kind of the person who's probably most at risk from this space herpes news is probably Elon Musk. Why? Because he's going to go into space. And... Because at some point he's going to run away from the SEC by going into space, and you know he must have a plethora of issues. Well, you can't get cocaine on Mars. He can bring, I mean, think about it. I mean, how, what, you know, you just bring like one kilo, I guess, and that should probably do him for the, for, for a while. Yeah, oh, you don't know Elon, obviously. A kilo a year? Are you kidding me? Or a kilo forever. I mean, I mean, you're kind of like, when you're, when you're, once you're there, I mean, that you're done. I mean, you're not. A kilo is only a thousand grams, Max. I don't know, dude. We, we got to cut some of this drug talk. We talk about illegal drugs literally every podcast. Well, well, they sh- maybe they shouldn't be illegal. You're going to upset some of your followers, Max. No, I'm not. They probably all like them. Can I say one more thing about space herpes? Yes. I think it's kind of cool not to like get space herpes, but just the fact that if space herpes is affected by like your G's, I think it's really neat that there's like an infectious disease that is affected by just gravity. There's you if you have gravity, gravity is preventing your herpes outbreaks. You go on to space, all bets are off because well, no. there's no gravity there. It's not preventing your, your outbreaks. Well, it's not directly like that. It's like I think your, it would be cool if it were true, Max. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. It would be cool if it's true. Yeah. Like your your immune system to me doesn't work quite as well because there's no gravity. Yes. Like imagine that. These are just little cells like floating around your body. What is gravity doing to them? Yeah, I mean, look, the whole gravity thing, is, it's really quite scary. I think it was in – um. One of the Arthur C. Clarke novels, like it might have been in 2010 or like the one after that one. No, but because like the main character and and you basically can't go home if you've been in space too long. And I think that's like 100 percent true. Well, the spacing guild in Dune become almost transhuman because they never come back down to the the surface of any planet. Yes. I mean, it it really does. I mean, there's also a lot of radiation. So that could be doing something. Maybe so it's probably ra- uh, you know mutated space mutants. herpes, space mutants. Yeah, so it's gonna be like life. You know that that movie with that little tiny like it was oh, like a yeah. cell that evolved into like this killer alien. Yeah, that movie was kind of good. It was it was quite a good movie. It was kind of scary and freaky. And you're like, no, don't do it. It's an alien. Just kill it. Yeah, it was good for like the type of. Uh, Crappy movie I was looking for when I looked for it at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a, I mean, a space horror. Yeah, there there space needs horror. to be more space horror. There needs to be more horror, like good horror movies. Like It's not so hard, guys. Just just make a nice quality horror movie. Anyway. Cool. Okay, um, I think I am done. I think I'm done, too. How about you, Brianna? I'm done. Great. I wait, think wait, we're wait, all done. Wait, actually, one, one more. I want to ask a question. So, Brianna, in your opinion, who should get paid more? Doctors or astronauts? Oh, doctors. 
Definitely. Definitely doctors. Well, Definitely you're right, doctors. because doctors do get paid more than astronauts. Do they? Yes. Well, astronauts are government workers. Okay, good. <laughs> astronauts get a decent amount of hazard pay, but doctors still get paid more. Yeah, but if, if doctors become you know uh, government workers under a, a Medicare for All system, then they probably won't get as paid as much as astronauts. All right, that's it for Armchair Healthcare. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, guys. And please uh, you know, subscribe to us on iTunes. And don't listen to any of our advice, medical, investment, or otherwise. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Our theme music is by Hazar.